Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Conn Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated. Today, I'm joined by former Washington Corner, Fred Smooth. Great conversation with Fred. Always entertaining. We talk football. We talk what he would do in the rematch against the Giants. We talk about what's a Fred Smoot Christmas like. And guess what, folks? He's not the loudest guy at the table. If you know Fred, it's hard to believe. We also talk a little bit about Mike Leach, who coached at his alma mater, Mississippi State. So and we, when I taped this with Fred, it was Tuesday. We just found out about Mike Leach. So we did start off the conversation with that. Stick around for Fred for a minute. I do want to go over a couple of injury updates. And one other thing that I, I'm asking, um, I want to help out a little bit here. So if, if you remember a couple of years ago, I did some private Zooms for people. I wanted to, to talk to people going through maybe a tough time just to offer you a little, dis, offer somebody a little distraction, talking football, whatever. I'd like to do that again. If you know anybody going through a tough time this holiday period, um, for whatever reason, drop me a line, hit me up at John underscore Kime on Twitter. You can drop a line on YouTube under the comments and we'll connect that way. But take advantage of that and I appreciate it. So that's one thing. Two of the injuries. Let's go over the injuries really quick. Benjamin St. Juiced was limited in practice on Wednesday with an ankle, with his ankle. Did, was, did not see him doing all of the positional work. So that's, but it was a step for him to be out there. So I'm do some stuff, but not all. So a lot of times they were doing some stuff. He's sitting there watching. Then you have guard Trey Turner. He's got a leg injury. He was out there. So he was limited today, but he was doing all the positional work when we watched the, when the portion was open to the media. That's a good sign. And I think I told you last week, he's expected to be okay. Then you have Sam Cosme, ankle injury. He was also, he's fine. He was full. Good sign for them. I expect him and Cornelius Lucas to continue, continue rotating at right tackle. At center, it was Wes Schweitzer. That's, and I told you last week that I expected him to be the guy there just because he fits what they want to do. Very physical in the run game. That makes more sense. And they feel like he's a smart player and, and you can handle all those protection calls. It's a tough task against the Giants, but that's, so he's going to be there. And I think that's a good move for them. That's to me, the right move. And defensive ends, you have Montez Sweat, James Smith Williams, both who coming off the concussion. They were both limited, but they did go through all the positional work. And then they retreated to the side field during the team portion of practice. And then there's Chase Young. Still don't know what's going to happen with him. He did talk to the media on Wednesday. His mood was different than the, from the last time he talked to us a few weeks ago. When at that point, he kind of had to be talked into talking with these. He's always been very polite and respectful to us, but you could tell he really didn't want to talk. I think he's really kind of, he wants to be out there playing. Don't blame him at all. Today, he was, when we talked to him on Wednesday, he was in a much more upbeat mood and, and it was more of him, more of who he was or who he is. And so I think that's a good sign for him. What that means for the games, I don't know. I know the tough part is it's all going to depend on how he feels later in the week, how, how that knee feels. And the tough, the thing that people have to remember is not the ACL anymore. He tore that, yes. But if, if it had been just about the ACL, as people close to me said, he would have been out on the field a month or two ago. It's really, it's about the ruptured patella tendon. That's what has taken so long. And that's where he and they are going to be the most cautious. As Young said, to, told us today, I trust the process. I'm only 23. In other words, he's got a long career ahead of him. He wants to make sure that everything is completely right and how the knee feels before he goes back out there. And they're the same way. So there you go. That's the quick injury update. I, I told you we got my conversation with Fred Smoot. So let's get to Washington, former Washington corner, Fred Smoot, the always entertaining Fred Smoot. But Fred, before we get to football, and I want to talk about a lot of stuff. And first of all, for people who haven't seen you and Logan together at the command center on the commander's website, it's yeah. always really good stuff. I love the breakdowns you guys do. It's a few minutes of good explanation on the plays that happen and all that. Going to get into the final four games, the Sunday game against the Giants. But I do want to start with, you know, um, Mike Leach. And we're taping this on Tuesday morning. We heard yeah. the news about Mike Leach passing. That's your alma mater. What what was your relationship with him? And, you know, that's that's got to hit hard. Uh, well, you know, once you're part of that Mississippi State family, we are family. That's the way we always go. That's the way we move. I had a couple of conversations with Coach and uh, one of a kind, if I can say that. Uh, you'll never meet another Mike Leach again. I think what he says is what he means and what he means is what he says. And I and I enjoy that banter. 
And just the way it happened, I think it just, you know, shocked the college football world. You know, uh, you I don't know how many circumstances we've had in the past why a active coach actually passed away right. while he was he was still coaching. So uh this one right here, this this hurts. This hurts the Mississippi State family. My prayers goes out to the Leach family and everybody involved. He's only 61. That that's yeah. what yeah. Yeah. And you know, for him to have a, a traumatic heart condition like that. And that's why I me mean, myself, I always told tell people all the time, man, you have to live every day like the last because right. we, we we don't know when it's over. I can't imagine a conversation involving Fred Smoot and Mike Leach. Uh, it's, it's exactly how you think it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's but the college football world's going to miss him, and because he was such a he kept things light, and I think he it was a reminder through him that in the end we are supposed to have fun with this stuff. Yes, it's still a child's game. Mm -hmm. And he's one of those people, he takes that game very serious, but it's also refreshing to see coaches that, yes, he's 100% football, but he is Mike Leach. He's a person inside of that football right. coach. And he wasn't afraid to let you know that. And he wasn't afraid to let you introduce you to the person and not just the football coach. And I like that he would give opinions on different things just because, again, you're a person. If you're, if you, are so wrapped up in this that you can't have an opinion on just a fun opinion on something else. And you just made him seem more human to, to yeah, a lot of his, people. his relationship, <laughs> his relationship uh, advice is, is one in a million. Yeah. Yes. I, <laughs> I agree. Well, maybe you can take that over and give some, what would be your relationship advice? Uh, your this is what, when it comes to relationship advice, I say this, marry your best friend. Like wow. I think you, I think you have to marry your best friend. And if your counterpart is not your best friend, it's gonna be hard to get through those rough patches. Because I tend to think that people are more lenient on their best friend than they are their lover. Because their best friend comes with understanding. So if you can have that all in one, I think you got this. You 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 got the goal right there. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I've told my kids that because I did that, and I tell them it's like you you better marry somebody that you like as well. You have mm -hmm. to like them as a person because the love is going to always be there, but you better like them because you're going to spend so much time with them. If you don't like them, eventually it'll be, it'll be difficult. And so people are now just tuning in like, what the hell are these two talking about? <laughs> so, 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 and they're not, we're not talking about the fact that we have matching shirts on or sweaters oh, on. Oh, so. that, that, that's what we do, Kyle. We, hey, we've, been in, we've been here for a long time, bro. You know, mine does not say legend. So I think there's like, there is a difference here, but I get that. So I, I need to earn that, that mark there. But let's talk about, let's talk about um, this game in general, though, for you. What's it like as a player getting ready? Because these games now, I know like every game matters, right? Yeah. But you, yeah. What's it, what, how different does it feel when you get down to the end of the season and these games become a little bit bigger? Well, you got different tempos of the NFL. You got the preseason, you got the early regular season, and you got the late regular season that's actually playoff mode. We are in playoff mode. This team has been in playoff mode for a while. That's why I feel good about this game. They know every play counts. And I just think at the end of the day, if they can go out and be true to who they are, right? true to who we are and, and the way we win, and don't try to get outside of ourselves. Like, we're not here to win a broody pageant. We're here to win games. And I like that about this team. They don't care how ugly the game gets, how muddy the game gets. It, it, it's their type of game. And that's why I feel good about this team moving forward. They have been playing playoff style football since the season started. Yeah. Like it's a couple of teams nobody wants to play. The 49ers, for example. Yeah. Nobody wants to play the 49ers. Well, guess what? We're built exactly the same way as the 49ers. I, when I say the same way, I mean the if you go to the, the details, Brock Purdy and Heineke are the same clone. All right. Yeah. All right. Then you get into I I know Debo hurt now, but they got a Debo Samuels that a guy that they moved from wide receiver to running back. Well, we got a Curtis Samuel. We got a brother from the Samuels family also that we <laughs> use in that way. Uh they got Brandon IU. We got Terry McLaurin. Um, we only thing that these teams are not built identical like because the front on defenses are built the same, is they have a they have a Trent Williams. Yeah. who we used to have, and yeah. we don't have a Trent Williams. Other than that, we're built the same. So nobody wants to play the Ravens. Nobody wants to play the 49ers. We are part of that group that nobody wants to play. And yeah, and I'm going to get to that in a minute too. But as for you, like go back to your days and like yeah. what's it like 
you're getting ready for a game in there. What's it like in the locker room? What's it like on yeah. the field before the game? Is Do you feel a difference? Can you feel a different buzz from the crowd or just from the players? Or does it feel like, hey, it's another game. It just is a little bit bigger. It's never another game. It's, a, it's another game with another layer on it. Right. Uh, so now, as you would see some guys, and I'm always happy-go-lucky pregame. I keep a smile on my face. Serious, but not so serious that I'm, I'm getting in my own head. I just think at the end of the day, it's more pre pressure on the coaches than it is the players because the mm -hmm. players, we're routine. We're used okay. to doing what we're doing. So that chess match is actually against, you know, the Jack Del Rio and Dayball. That, that, mm -hmm. that goes – they they go where the, the confrontation starts because we're only going to do what they tell us to do anyway. We're going to show up to play, and this team going to show up to play. And that's why I tell people, we didn't had some, how should I say, fruit gazy winning over this, over this time, over the last 20 years. This group I feel different about because of the way, not only the way they do win, they're used to winning. I right, mm -hmm. think about most of this majority of this team is from Alabama, Ohio State. Success is nothing new to these guys. They chew it up, they process it, they spit it back out. You see nobody get so high by the wind. They stay right in the middle. I enjoy this about this team. They tell me that they're they, they going to win with longevity. This won't just be a flash in the paint. There is a definite mindset that has developed that I think some of those Gibbs teams had when you got when you were here. Like, yeah. you know, I thought like, you know, I always felt like there was a different mindset with that group. And I felt like that one early on when they were one and four, I remember thinking, boy, they have like really good camaraderie. They really believe in this. But they're not winning. Is it? Are they going to waste all that? Well, right now, I'd say they're not. No, they're not. not and, I, and I remember having a talk with Art Monk and Ricky Sanders, and we was talking about the difference in football teams. And we talked about my teams, and I was like, yeah, my teams were very gifted. We had Pro Bowl players everywhere. But today was a football family. Football families win championships. Uh, uh, high-end players go to the Pro Bowl. And that's the difference. They had a family atmosphere. And I know this family, I mean, this team is a family because they forged by fire. Uh, and when, when you go through stuff as a family, that brings mm -hmm. you closer. Uh, they went through Montez Sweat and his brother's situation. They went through Coach Rivera's cancer. They went through Coach Rivera's mama. They just had one drama and one thing after another. And that drama draws them together. And, and it makes them hardened. And it makes you go out there and, and put everything on the line for your brother. So, you know, like they say, pressure make diamonds. I think we're looking at a diamond when we look at this group. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. And, you know, when, let's look at this game because I know one of the things you brought up in your command center stuff with, with Logan was the need that you felt like they should play more man in the second game. Is, yeah, is that right? Yeah. And tell, tell people why. Tell, tell, say, why is that? I, when you play man, I get to overflow the box. And when I get to overflow the box, I get to dictate. The one thing I love about playing for Greg Williams, we were the dictator on defense. We didn't sit back and take your punches. And if you play more man to man, that allows you to add a Jamin Davis to the box, a Bostic to the box, and force them to be one-dimensional. We know this. Saquon Barkley is not healthy. Regardless of what he said last week, the week before last, he even got hurt in this game. This is a Daniel Jones game, but Daniel Jones turns to Vanilla Vic when we play him. We cannot <laughs> stop him. And, 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 you know, so now I'm looking at this game like, all right, now we're only going to focus on Daniel Jones. So now we're going to force Daniel Jones to beat us inside the pocket, and we're going to force him to beat us with his arm with a group of wide receivers that impress no one. So at the end of the day, it can be a very one-sided game if we attack and we're aggressive and we do it from the start. If we can pin this team down early, they won't crawl back. All right, they won't crawl back, but if you let them hang around, all right, if you let that fungus among us hang around, it could kill us. And one of the one of the keys to me in this one is if Benjamin St. Juice plays and the, the yeah, ability to play yeah. there. How big is how big a key is that, you think? Well, it's 6'3, 200 pounds big. All right. The yeah. one thing about what, what he brings to that outside is I was watching uh some old tape from like 04 last night of us playing and me and Sean Spring and we pressed 80% of the time. Yeah. Like that was our team. We're gonna take we're gonna take all the error out of it. And this is what most young corners do not get. I if I play off man and we're in man to man coverage, I have to stop the entire route tree. That's 10 to 12 yeah. routes. If I simply walk down and press, I got two routes. Slant in the fade. They won't run anything else at you. It's an automatic chant to a slant in the fade. So I said, let me make the numbers work for me. 
I'm just going to learn how to stop slants and fades because I'm going to go down and put my hands on these guys. And St. Juice loves to be physical, loves to put his hand on the guys. We watched last time. They, they went deep on us three or four times because St. Juice wasn't there. Why not just throw it up? But luckily, guys like Defoe Farts is playing out of his mind. Yeah. Cameron Curley has been that study. Just he reminds me of Brian Dawkins in the way he goes about handling mm -hmm. his business. And they've been steady enough at their safety that no matter who's playing corner, they, they, they're succeeding. And I just, I always want to know this. When you have a guy like Danny Johnson, for the last three years, we'll just throw Danny Johnson in and expect him to play. And every time he shows up and play, why not play him now while the guy, the numbers are down? Well, I didn't understand why they released him in training camp, especially mm -hmm. for some, because that was a, such an inexperienced group. And there are some guys who always find their way back, and he's one yep. of them. And he he went in last week after Christian Holmes had a couple of struggles, and then he went in against the Giants in that second half. He went back in there, but I do think like there are certain you know with with um with with the zone too or the off man. Here's my issue with off man. Like mm -hmm. I get the off coverage if you're trying to depending on who's gonna maybe somebody's gonna buzz to this flat or something like you know what I mean. Like maybe there's mm -hmm. a play you're doing off that. But when you're playing off, I don't understand why you also then start to backpedal immediately and not just maybe flat foot a little bit more. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's hard to flat foot because we can be in a couple of coverages playing off. We can be an off man. What okay. we try to do with off man is make it look like cover three. Right. Okay. We, we try to make it look like cover three because sometimes we are in cover three. And that shields us from having to get out of there quick. I was one of those people. I would not really flat footed because I want my feet to be moving. But, Maybe but not I was slow my back pedal. I was okay. slow my back pedal. That's what to okay, point, yeah. To the point that I would not run myself out of a play. But I'm also sometimes in those situations, they have us reading two to one. So let's say I'm on a wide receiver, I got a wide receiver to my side and a tight end to my side. I want to make sure I get an eight yards depth okay. so I can watch that tight end push up that field. And once he shows me his last name and his back numbers and he leaves me, I turn and all my attention goes to number one. So you have those interesting things about it that you need to do. So it, 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 it's always time need to play off. Like sometimes sure. you, you have to play right. off, but you're right. There's no reason to get out of there. I would not backpedal because of this D-line. If I had well, this D-line when I played, I'm in no rush to go anywhere. And I think maybe that's kind of what I'm talking about too. And also you're right. Not, maybe not flat foot, but take – a slower back pedal. So if you have to drive on something in front of you, you can, it's easier to do that. But I think also with the man, here's the other thing with the man too. And you brought up the spies um, on the quarterback. And I know on Jones hurt them in that first game, more on scrambles than on design runs. Yeah. And the one was a 21 yard run where they have, they had, they did have a spy in that play overruns. Jones runs out to the right. They overrun the play, leaves a cutback. How often you know, when you talk to defensive corners, they always talk about how, well, they don't like to use spies that much and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. How often do you think you can use that and still play the way you want to? I think we can do it for four quarters this game. Like and every play or how how much are we talking? Like, because I, well, you know, I, I, the question is, kind of, who's your spy? Right. Right? <laughs> if, if, if I'm putting a spy uh, I only have two options. It's either Jamin Davis or Cameron Curl. Right. And maybe maybe Forrest. I, I'm going to have a safety chasing this guy down, not not a linebacker. I'm going to have a safety chasing this guy down. And also, with them not having the big threats on the outside, with them not having a dominant tight end, with their best offensive player, Saquon Barkley, being hurt, it allows me to do stuff that I usually yeah. wouldn't do. And that's why I say it. The more aggressive we come out here, to bring the crowd in the game and take the Giants out the game, that's the whole purpose. But like you said, I would run. It wouldn't be a third down that I would not have a spy on okay. Daniel Jones because I can't afford to let him get two or three first downs with his legs this week. I just can't let it happen. So in, in other words, like you're saying, like use what they don't have to your advantage. To their advantage. Uh, you got missing guys. Right, Daniel Jones, the one thing we know about him, if you give him a play, he'll take it. He'll make it, all right? If you make him think and go through his progressions, he tends to turn the ball over. And that's what I want him to do. Like, if I'm telling Sweat, I'm telling Obata, I'm telling uh, uh, Hill, rush up the field, but stop at five. Stop at five yeah. and flatline. I, I'm not, I don't want you turning the corner on this guy. I, I want you to stop at five and force him to beat us from the pocket.
And I think that's that's been the hard part for this team with some of these mobile quarterbacks. Is there's a, there's a, there are enough rushes where a gap develops as you're rushing four, and there, there's going to be a gap. And if you're playing man, that's when you can get hurt. That's the one downside to man, but I think the upside is is greater. But you got to have a hip that makes right. your zone blitz. Oh like, yes, uh, yeah. Zone blitz and man go hand to hand mm-hmm. because right when you think we in man, and that's where the off coverage mm-hmm. come back at kind. Yeah, there you go. Right when you think we in man, now he lets the ball go in a man situation, and we're zone blitz, and they go turnovers. That's that's how you manufacture turnovers. What do, what do you like about the way this defense has developed? Well, I like one that they're homegrown. I love the fact it just guys take pride when we're homegrown. I I'm a I'm a Washington player from the day I was born to the day I ended. All right. And that and when you come in a locker room with guys like that and guys are not really cherry picked from every team, it's a certain pride that comes with John Allen has been a Washington fan his whole life. It's pride that comes with that. Deron Payne, that's pride, that's sweat, that's pride. And like I said, I'm just more uh in up with these guys and love the fact that they they, they play like a fan. They got each other back. I can tell when people have each other back and they're on the same accord. Like last year when we wouldn't make plays, it would be a lot of talking, but they weren't saying nothing. Mm-hmm. Now I'm watching them talk, and it's leading to plays being made. So that's telling me the front end, the back end, the linebackers, they're all on the same page. And for as much drama and stress and hatred that people spewed over Jamin Davis at the beginning of the year, nobody's talking now. Uh, he's, he's playing well. like a high-level linebacker. He's played well. And I agree. Like, the thing that always tweaked me a little bit with that was there was no allowance for growth. And, you know, and you had to see like last year was not what you would want from a 19th overall pick, but there were flashes toward the end and send them, how do you progress? And he has certainly progressed and, you know, and that you have to give him credit. Oh, you have to give him credit. And that's what I do love about the Rivera era is he has allowed some guys to mature. He's allowed Cameron Curl to mature. Yeah. Uh, most people wouldn't have thought when we drafted Farge that he'll be making the plays right. that he claimed that you let him mature. Like when you let Casey Two Hill mature, you don't have to rush back or chase Young. Right. All right. So, you know, the thing about it is this group is very deep. And the one thing that we have advantage over most teams at this time of year, we're healthy. I, I know we're missing a couple of offensive linemen, but we're healthy. Think about the 49ers. They just lost Debo. As, as good as you feel about them, I'm sorry. You don't take a Debo out of offense and think it's just going to go like it was going. So, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we we had that blessing right now by the football guys where we could be the healthiest team headed to the playoffs. They're, they're in good shape with that. Derek Force, you brought him up. And I think like he's been a fun one to watch. Like, and I had him on, I talked to him for the podcast a few days ago, but he's been a fun kid to watch because I don't think anybody expected what we're seeing. Are you surprised? I, 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 I no, I wasn't because I got a chance to watch him and the rest of the guys he had in Cincinnati with, with Kobe Bryant, Sauce. Yeah. I watched those guys. I always thought they were one of the best college defense backfields I had seen in a while. Me and my homeboy, Percy, would talk about it all the time. He was like, he's that guy that he did not cap, he did not capside in college, meaning he, he can only get better. Right. Like, we haven't seen his peak performance yet, and I just knew if he got with somebody that was patient enough to let him develop, that he would have a chance to be a playmaker in this league. What have you thought of Taylor's Heineke's play? I love Heineke and Heineke is one of them guys never probably had to work another day in his life. He, <laughs> he, he has that Shane Falco, uh, that underdog mentality. Everybody loves the underdog. He has that it factor and that it is full of like, it's like 10 things that give him that it factor. And I, I think he's a galvanizer. And that's what it is. Like, every family need a matriarch. When we go home for Thanksgiving and Christmas, we're probably going to the matriarch's house because they bring people together. Where the matriarch of this team is Heineke. All right? And the great thing about it, this team is built – I hate to say this. This team is built to win with average quarterback play. All right? Mm-hmm. And, that's, and people can say that about the 49ers. Mm-hmm. That's why they still pick right. to go to the, uh, the Super Bowl because they're built to win without needing Pat Mahomes. All right? We are built to win without needing Pat Mahomes. The question is, what Heineke do we get 
for these last four games in this playoffs. And when that time comes in the fourth quarter, when we need that Dak Prescott drive from the other night, where mm -hmm. it's the last time you get the ball, what you going to do? Is he going to be able to answer that bell? That, that's going to be the question with Heineke. And it, it, yes, and I think, you know, we see that the variance from quarter to quarter sometimes with him too. You know, what, as a defensive back, when, you know, when you face a guy like that, because he doesn't have the strongest arm, but he does seem to, he's willing to make a tough throw as well. No, he so might he's, got, he's willing to make any throw yeah. in any one day. And everybody talks about his arm. I hate to report the news to people. We signed the guy. He was working at a college. All right, now he went through all season. His arm has got stronger. The question is, I see a little timid in him when he first came. It wasn't there. It was more heroics. Now I'm seeing him use his feet less. And I'm wondering, have they told him because we don't want to put the backup in. We need you to be a little bit more careful. Well, I don't think going into the playoff, we don't need him to be careful. I need Wild Heineke because I feel like this. Tame Heineke and Wild Heineke are going to make them two, three throws a game that can be picked off. So I would rather have the edgy version that's diving for the pylon than the one that's trying to stay in the pocket. And I, I always like my thing with him with the legs, it's always on scrambles and extending plays more than yeah. on design runs because I don't want to see designed runs for him because to me, you're taking it away from Robinson, Gibson, one of the other targets. But the, the ability to extend plays like that fourth down against the Giants is huge. And then like, the throw off that to Samuel was huge. So that's where I think he's at his best, I think. Would do you agree? No, I agree. And Let's look at the quarterbacks we've won Super Bowls with. Uh, yeah. Doug, Joe Theismann, Mark Rippin. Uh, nobody at the time would have said they was the Pat Mahomes of their age. No. Uh, Coach Gibbs developed a whole team identity to where he could plug and play quarterbacks. Right. Uh, we're, we're built very similar to that. Yeah. What, what have you thought about Jahan Dotson and him being back? How much of a yeah. difference can he make? Because, like, the first games back, they were using him a little bit less, more tight yeah. ends. Uh, and I know it's a game to game, game plan situation. Yeah. But he also, the kid can make plays. What do you think of what you've seen from him? Uh, he's wise beyond his, his age. He has this, this grownness and this subtleness to him. Uh, that route he ran where he, he did the spin move at the end, everybody is so enamored with the spin move. As a Kona, I'm so enamored with the stem, how he stemmed <laughs> off the line. He sat out, he, he quieted his feet, made the the, 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 the cornerback stop his feet, then made a second move, made him open his hips again, and then left. He left the cornerback by seven yards off of two stems, you usually get that from an eight-year wide receiver, all right? His subtleness, his, his 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 first step out of cuts is unbelievable. And he's one of them guys, he knows when to use his speed against you. Uh, he knows when to outslow you. He knows how to position his body. He's one of those guys, he can pretty much do everything. And, and it's sky's the limit with this kid. Like, sky's the limit with this kid because he can literally do everything. He's a red zone threat that's not the biggest yeah. guy. And that's because of his suddenness. He can beat you down the field because of his speed. I think with Johan Dotson, I think you got an all-around wide receiver. And he's just scratching the surface. Yeah, That's no. the scary thing about it. I know. I love watching him. And that route, he had he threw like a little hesitation move at the end, too, which was yeah, you know, if you're, you know, it, it was it was great. And and you he creates that separation. And that spin move. Uh yeah. me, me and Logan was talking about. I said the reason that spin move was so good, he not only got to full speed and when he was running, he he made that spin move with all of his weight on his heel, mm -hmm. not on his tiptoe. So it wasn't going to be a true stop. It was going to be a stop with motion. And like I said, that's that's like that's like veteran stuff right there. That's veteran stuff. How dangerous does it make that receiver and trio? And like, and I know that they want to keep running the ball, and that's their emphasis. Yeah. But then you look at those three guys, how much more dangerous does it make them as a group? Uh, it makes them very dangerous. Listen, Terry is so damn good that it's disturbing. I, I try to tell people this. People don't understand how good he is out to the catch. I think Terry mm -hmm. could be, besides Tyreek Hill, the best guy out to the catch. And do you notice the first man never gets Terry down? Yeah. Never gets Terry down. Terry can get on top of you. Terry can do everything. Imagine if Terry had a, how should I say, a, a franchise quarterback, yeah. somebody that he knew was going to give him 130 balls a year. He'll be a 100-catch guy, yeah. like, easily. Yeah. But he's not the guy that's going to come and yap about it and try to grab that attention. True 
number one receiver. If I go down the playoff teams in the NFC, maybe A.J. Brown, you would want to take over him, but who else would you take over him in the NFC? It's not Brandon Ayuk. Uh, it's, it's not like he would be that guy. And Curtis Samuels, he the brother of Debo to me, but nobody treats him like yeah, that. No, I think he can something. do everything Debo can do. Yeah. He can do everything Debo can do. He's a Swiss arm, and I, I would actually like to see him return some punts. Then you match him with a Johan Dotson. All three of these guys can beat you one on one. You can't. Who are you going to double? I, that's the question. You double Terry. The other two going to do surgery on you. Right. And I think they're going to, if they can stay together, they're going to open it up for each other. I, and I agree on 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 Jahan especially. With the, the funny thing is, that after that catch the other day, it felt like it turned into a punt return situation for him because he's used to that open field. You know, has some room to make some moves with Terry. Last thing on Terry, what is something that you know we've talked a lot about him and how good he is. But as a yeah. cornerback, what is something that he does that you say people don't talk enough about this? And it's one reason why he's hard for a corner to defend. Oh, shit. Is there uh, anything? Let me, let me open this dictionary. All right, check this out. When it comes to this guy, the better the competition, the better he plays. Yeah. You show me a scary defense, I show you a Terry defense. <laughs> he will dominate them. All right, my guy, big play slate, Mississippi State Bulldog. He has yeah. – problems with nobody but Terry McLaurin. Yeah. He can't figure him out, can't stop it. Because if I'm a wide receiver and I'm trying to diagnose him, I'm studying him during the week, I'm like, all right, he fast as hell, but that ain't his that ain't his defining factor. He come out of cuts quick. That's not his defining factor. He never misses a drop of ball. That's still not his defining factor. He does everything well. He does nothing great. All right? So when you have no defining factor as a wide receiver, you are harder for me to stop. What, 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 do I have to worry about you on the seventh route? Do I have to worry about you on the slant? Do I have to worry about you on the D? Uh, on the comeback, that means the whole route tree is open with him yes. because he doesn't have a, a he doesn't have something that defines him. And I think that's what makes him so scary for a cornerback. He's hard to prepare for. Yeah, and I I agree with that because you see sometimes he he knows when somebody's playing him for a certain route and he's going to run the slant. And he's going to sell the route you think he's going to run, and he's breaking it off. So I always like watching him and talking to him about his routes because he has a game plan, a very specific game plan for every corner that he faces, and he can tell you why. Like, I love talking to him after the games or during the week after a game, like against Slay or, or yeah, Alexander, yeah. where he can say, this is why I ran this against him because I set it up the week before. What is your um, biggest concern going forward with this team? Biggest concern, I'm afraid if somebody uh, starts fast on us. Um, mm -hmm. I'm afraid if some if we get down 10 to 0, how do we respond? Do we stick with the running game or do we drop back and pass the ball 40 times, which is not the way Heineke wins? Right. right. All right so I, I, I'm just – how how long before it bites us? You see what I'm saying? And then when it bites us, how do we respond to it? How do we attack? Do you let those three wide receivers start to dictate the game then? And that's the question. And if that happens, do Coach them find themselves in a situation where they say we need the long ball and they throw Carson back in it? Like, like people are so enamored by him. I mean, uh, Heineke, I just still think it's a play in there for, for Carson if it, it push comes to shove. Right. Now, last thing, what's a Fred? We're close to Christmas. What's a Fred yeah. Smoot Christmas look like? Ah, uh, you know me. I I was just talking like I love to put the, the train set around the, 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 the Christmas tree. I love I love I like to do little stuff for my kids. I'm an only child, so my mama always made Christmas special for me. So I like to hang stuff around the house. You'll probably get a rotten tooth in my house because I got like candy everywhere. And I'm not like 1980, so it won't be no fruitcake nowhere, John Kai. <laughs> no, I have candy everywhere, but you know, it's all about my kids, it's all about my family. I, I get to enjoy everything. I got to go home on, on Thanksgiving. Uh, to a smooth Thanksgiving and nothing like that. Got to go to the Egg Bowl. Got to watch uh, Mississippi State win. So it, it felt good just to go back home for the holiday. What's it like when the Smoots all get together? Are you the loudest one, or how I'm do you? I'm not. My aunts, my aunties, they are so loud. And not only did we have a good Thanksgiving after I came back from the game, we always have a football game. They get plays in the backyard, and this is women and men in my family. And the funny part about it. Uh, Thanksgiving when my mom 
she found out she was pregnant with me. She was playing football <laughs> against against my uncle and my aunties, and my uncle tackled her, and she got sick, and they took her to the hospital. And they were like, "Nah, you're pregnant." So it, it's it's a whole universal thing that goes around with my family and Thanksgiving football. That that's fantastic. I didn't know that. That's that's great. How do you do in those games now? Uh, oh, 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 listen, I get out there and get hurt. You know, I ain't got no more plays left in me. I got a couple of uh, young cousins. One, he's uh, just started in junior college. We got a couple of more coming. So we got some young, smooth athletes coming. Fred, you're the best. Thanks a lot, man. Anytime, Kyle. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Fred for joining me. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. Remember, take advantage of that offer I made really would like to try and provide a distraction for somebody if they're going through a tough time. The next, the next podcast will come out. It'll be the keys and predictions will come out Saturday. So I will talk to you next time.